Hello, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to our reports training. Um, we are going to be talking about items in both USAS and US, uh, USPS today. So um, we'll talk about um, multiple things as far as reports. I'm going to start in USAS. Once we get to talking about customizing reports, those things are applicable in both software, both um, parts of the software. So um, we'll kind of just go through one at a time. Um, I do want to let you know that it is possible we'll go over an hour today. I know we usually keep these Fridays with Fiscal to an hour, but I wanted to talk about reports and then I wanted to also get report bundles in here. So there is a possibility we'll go a little bit longer. Um, but as we go, um, as always, if you have questions on anything I'm talking about, feel free um, to you know unmute and chime in. I do have my chat up, so I'll be checking that. Um, just to make sure if you have any questions along the way, we can talk about those. Okay, so let's get going. So um, as always, I'm starting on our wiki page and um, just to kind of um, hop in here, brief overview, we'll definitely be going into different parts of the wiki um, as we go today. But um, just to start, USAS documentation, and um, we have this reports menu. Most of the information is here for USAS. We'll talk about a couple of reports that are on the periodic menu. Um, we'll do a couple tips on those, but um, report bundles, the report manager, this is where we see template reports and then canned reports. So let me go ahead and hop right in here. All right. So the very first thing that I just want to have a little discussion about before we start kind of looking at like, okay, this is how reports work. Here's examples of how they run is a huge thing that's happened in USAS over the last year or so is that we have been converting some of these reports that were template reports over to canned reports. And so what that means is, um, and I've moved some of them here, is a lot of these reports that have a template version that you can access through the report manager, that you can access through this homepage, that you can customize. A lot of these have been recreated and added to this report menu, and now there is a canned version. So... Um, the account activity report, this gives you a version of the budget account activity report, the revenue account activity report. We have the budget summary, disbursement detail, financial detail, and this purchase order detail report. Now, the other reports that were on here, oh, the audit report, we're going to talk about that one later too. But um, a lot of these reports that were already on here, like revenues and expenditures, vendor new hire, there was something special about them originally that required them to be a canned report. So one of the main differences here with the reports is that the template reports, you can hop in, you can customize. We'll look at that report, um, like creator view, where you can edit the reports. And so the reports that started here were ones that had something special about them, maybe that like the vendor new hire report that also creates a submission. So that's not something that you would really like customize that report differently. Um, revenues and expenditures report that actually does the difference between figures. It subtracts instead of adding like you would like you have the ability to do on the template report. So that had to be a canned report because it, it's special. It needed to have that extra programming and it needed to have that special like format sometimes. You know, some of these have format. So um, that's really like where we used to be with canned reports. But these new ones that have been added, um, they are special, um, but in a different way. So like the budget summary report, this is going to look just like the budget summary report that you get from a template version, but it's going to be a lot faster. Same thing with the financial detail report. We added these because this was a way that we could increase the performance of these reports. And so, you know, I know, especially, you know, for districts and it's like over time and people have converted at different times, but I just want to highlight this because if you're having any districts and they're 
you know, having long, long report running times, the very first thing I would check is, is it one of these reports and are they running the canned version? Because that's going to be a huge benefit to them to be running the canned financial detail instead of the template financial detail detail. And like, when I say huge benefit, I mean like the financial detail report runs like so, so fast. Um, you know, instead of having to wait an extended amount of time, like they have it in like a minute. So um, it's definitely, you know, something that you want to keep an eye on, want to be aware of uh, when you're helping out your districts. So I just kind of wanted to start with that. Um, that said, I do also know that there have been multiple changes over time. This one, another one we're going to talk about is the dynamic sort. And um, that's the ability to kind of add your headers and subtotals on the fly. Um, so that's been implemented over the last couple of years. Um, but one reason that I wanted to touch base really with these reports, start off with this conversation, is because I know that a lot of the districts that converted in the early waves, um, they did they used reports a lot differently. You know, um, they use these template reports and they might have a whole lot of different versions of them because they might have customized for you know everything for they might have, i mean and, and they used to have to customize if they wanted different headers or different subtotals um so keep those things in mind over today where you know some of these districts that might have been doing it one way you know for a reason if that's how it was if they converted an early wave they might be able to adjust some of the their you know how they're using reports which versions of reports they're using now and it may be a big benefit to them um okay so uh let's see so we talked about the reports for performance i just want to make sure i didn't miss any of my notes here um okay so let's hop into one of these reports up on like i'm going to start with the canned reports up here so let's just start it off strong with the financial detail report. Um, now, actually, before we start looking at these options, um, let me also mention that in USPS, um, we do also see the same thing where there are, um, we have canned reports, we have the template reports. In USPS, a lot of the reports on that side are more complex uh, in general, or they're used to submit things like I'm talking STRS, SERS. And so a lot of those started off as canned reports. So, you know, if you're familiar more so with the USPS side, you're probably just more familiar with, you know, a lot of these things, you know, the ones that you use a whole lot are the canned reports. And so, you know, that hasn't really changed, um, but just to kind of compare there. So, okay, so I've hopped into a financial detail report. And the other thing here, I'm just gonna zoom out a little bit is when um here let me go to my default settings so if you've never run this report uh this is what it'll just default to when you come in it's got some blanks here for the dates uh you have the options to choose um some filters as far as account codes but you'll notice the start and end date these have this little asterisk here if i just tried to run this without start and end dates it would tell me it would you know it's required so it makes us enter these in which this is one thing that you know we updated with having this as a canned version because in the template version it doesn't tell you that it's required um but if you run it without start stop dates like it would run for all of time and take forever so um so let's go ahead and put in the start and end date here and i'm going to run it for the previous fiscal year um now well which actually my instance is still in june so i'm going to run it for um, fiscal year 22 and so we'll enter those in the other thing i want to point out down here um just kind of as like an improvement between like the template version and the canned version is the total as of period so um you know right now the totals are going to be as of my current period as of june but if I wanted um, a report, like say I'm running a budget summary, uh, it'd be a little bit more relevant with like the account-based reports, then um, the as of period, instead of having to type in just like a date, 
now I can actually select from this list. So, you know, we saw the opportunity with, um, with upgrading these for performance and decided to update a couple other things to make them a little bit more user-friendly too. So um, if I had a report where I was using as of period, I could come in here and actually choose like, here's the month and year I want it as of. Same thing with filters. So instead of having to type in, you know, the exact account filter with the right spacing and capitalization, um, which actually capitalization, I think we updated, but um, I don't have to worry about, you know, if it's got a space between the words or a dash or whatever, um, I can just pick from the list. So if I want my athletics filter, boom, it's there. I can pick it. Um, so that makes it a little bit easier with entering filters as well. Our show options, we'll add the show options page, a summary report um, will give us the, the short version that's just got um, anything that, that's uh, set as a header. And then we do have um, these sort properties available on these reports as well, which we're going to talk about those in a little bit. But um, So let's do, uh, let's go ahead, we'll add a filter here. And then if we generate, I want to take a look at this because, um, and of course I ran this for a blank one. Okay, let's just do it for our general fund. And see very quick. Um, so when we open this up, what I want to show here is, okay, so we open our report, it gives me here's our start and stop dates that we ran it for. So this is our length of time, any transactions dated within that length of time are going to show on this report. Now, because I ran it for a fiscal year, I ran it starting 7-1. It says, okay, so because you started 7-1, I can include the initial balance. Boom, right here. So this is the cash account. This is the, the balance, uh, the, the initial uh, cash for this account. And then I have all of my activity. And then at the very end, I have the ending balance. Now, these balances are pulled directly from the cash account. So the cash account only keeps the initial balance since the beginning of the year. So if you run this for like a month date range, so say I just ran it for June, it won't show the initial balance because the initial balance is for the start of the fiscal year, not the start of June. So in order to keep that consistent, make it less confusing, it'll only include that initial balance if it's for a date range that it makes sense for, like the fiscal year. Um, okay. So the other thing that I want to quickly talk about here too is using these filters with the reports. And um, I'm going to keep using this financial detail as uh, an example, but for USAS, these account filters can be used, you know, with other reports. They can be used, you know, on um, the budget summary report, on, um, you know, your account activity reports, it can be used on any of these to filter down um, by account parameters. Now, I understand too with these uh, canned versions, you know, one of the differences, you can't customize them in the same way that you could customize a template report. A template report, we'll look at later, like configuring different options there, but you could add like whatever filters you want and so when we see this financial detail and it says include fund, well, what if I want to exclude a fund? What if I want multiple funds? Like, what if I want some, you know, different combinations of like this fund and this object and this OPU? I know that happens. I know that there are situations where they need that. And I know that when you just look at this page, that seems like, well, you know, how's that going to work? So what you can do is, oops, sorry, um, use your account filters in combination with these canned reports. And I think that, you know, there is, um, 
a possibility that, you know, if taking some time on the front end, maybe think through and set up some of these filters or like even, you know, if they set it up once and then keep track of what they're calling this, these filters, they might be able to use them again and again. So um, let's look at an example. Okay, so what I did for this is I made a salaries filter. And so I made this pretty simple, but you can make these more complex. So, you know, for this one, I um, just added for expenditure accounts, I want objects that start with a one, and then I gave that read only access. Um, if there are different situations where it might be, you know, some combination, you know, when they, they drill down, they have like very specific things they want to see. Um, they can add multiple rows here. And, um, you know, there's a lot you can do with account filters. I hope to talk more like focus specifically more on account filters in some future sessions. Um, but they have a lot of flexibility here. So if they build this account filter, they give it a name and save it. Then let's look at how we can use this. So um, going back to my financial detail report. So that filter is going to give me just my object codes in the 100s. So my salary objects, right? Now I can select this here. Whoops, wrong one. So I can select salaries. Now here's the thing, I can use this in combination with the filters here. So if I wanna see all of the salaries for the general fund, I can run this. And then if I have a different fund, like say I want like a grant, you know, a grant account, one of the grant accounts or like my cafeteria salaries, like, you know, whatever fund may, may make sense, like they can run it with different parameters here, keep the salaries filter in, so that those work in combination with each other. So um, here's my financial detail report. I plugged in the 001 on the fly, and then all of my account codes are in the 100s. Um, sorry, my object codes are in the 100s. So that was a pretty quick way. And then now I have that filter in there, and anytime I wanna use one of these and filter down by salaries, I can use that same exact one. I don't have to do the step of making the account filter every single time. Um, so oh, wrong one. So um, if we go back here to our account filters, you know, this is demo data. So some of this, you know, um, is just examples, but like, or is anonymized, but athletics, you know, we have that I have like a high school secretary one. And so maybe this one has a couple other things in here. Um, if it has blank for access, then that means it's gonna be excluded. So this is saying, you know, they won't see salaries or benefits, but they will see these things. So, you know, we could, we could use this on a report. Um, and again, I, you know, I know the account folders can be a lot to dive into, but um, you know, as you learn those and then um, just thinking about how they can be used with these canned reports, I think is going to be a huge benefit. The other thing I want to point out here. So um, I used this very first line, the save and recall earlier. Um, I used this for, you know, changing it back to the default. It does retain the most recent. So you'll notice as I navigate pages, I go back and forth. It's saving that I had these parameters in here. So the next time I come in, I can do that. But I can also save what I've, how I have run reports to make it much easier the next time. So, so I can save this as general salaries. I just did a tab after I typed that in and then I can do save. So now if I run this report for something else and then I come in here and I know I wanna do this for general salaries, I can just pick this from the list. I think it'll be something that, you know, I know like over time, it kind of takes like thinking about like, you know, how they're running this, if this is something they might run again, because they could easily just navigate for, away from this page and like never use this save and recall. But if these are things that, 
your districts can start thinking about and maybe, you know, get saved, then that's just a really small convenience that they can use again and again and again in the future. And as we talk about moving to using these canned reports, because, you know, you're getting the best performance from these canned reports. So, you know, think about if there is maybe like a custom version of a template report, if some of these things can, you know, maybe you can get a filter going, do a save and recall, and then that can replace a version of the template report that they use regularly. And then they're going to get that way faster and obviously be happier because, you know, like we don't, we, we know their time is valuable. So, um, so some of these pieces I think will, will help with, um, with things like that. Um, and then let's see. Okay. So the other thing is I, I want to mention, because obviously like, you know, I'm sitting here saying we want to, you know, go ahead and switch over to these as, as you can, so you can get the benefit of the fast reports. Um, I do just want to acknowledge the budget summary report. We're going to talk about these sortable properties later. I'm going to look at that on the template version of the budget summary report. We do have a bug where these account properties will not currently work. Um, and I know that this is something they want. The development team is aware of this bug. So that is something that we will be fixing. But um, as we talk about the, uh, we're going to see some examples of these on the template report. And like, of course, I want you all to be able to switch over and use those on this canned report in the future. But, you know, if you go and do that immediately after this training, sadly, it is um, not going to work at this moment, but um, we'll get it fixed. So, um, okay, before we move on to that, one more canned report I want to show you is the audit report. Okay, this honestly, I'm, I'm just going to say this has been so helpful. I feel like this is really exciting. You know, I know in classic, like the audit report was, you know, it's something you go to, like, especially when you're doing support for districts, like it's it's really helpful to see you know, what may have happened at what time, you know, who made the changes, when they made the changes, and it's just very helpful. I know it's helpful for them at the district too. So we had a template version of the audit report and um, the template versions were just, you know, they did take a while. They didn't have a lot of options to filter down. So when they changed this to a canned version of the report, like, Boom, they gave it to us. They they gave us the options, um, different objects. And so let's look at this. So this also has a save and recall. So if there is some combination of these that they would use regularly, they can do the same thing where they save their parameters. We have a start and stop date. Um, and then operations so create is like i can see if a record was added update i can see if um a record was changed and delete is if something was was deleted was removed and i have the ability like if i know that it's just something that was a change i can uncheck you know, I can check and, you know, that helps me drill down these reports a little bit because they can be huge if we're just running for everything. So if you're looking for something specific and you know that it might be something that was just a change, like very helpful. Um, the next thing is specific objects. And I mean, I remember trying to choose these in classic and it was like, you had the list and you had to choose the right number. Like, so this is amazing. You can click, move it over. Uh, we could click multiple. We can use like, I'm just hitting control so I could just pick whichever I want um, to highlight, to control on my keyboard um, and move those over. Or I can do shift on my keyboard to select everything in between the two I'm clicking, um, which uh, so a lot of those tricks like um, are the same with, you know, different reports that have options like this. Um, but it's just very helpful. Um, so let's go ahead, um, 622. Well, let me point out a couple of these options first. Uh, so obviously your transactions, you know, that's helpful. Who made this purchase order? When was it made? Um, but 
posting period. That's one I found to be super helpful. When was it open? When was it closed? Uh, who created it? Um, those kind of things can be very helpful uh, just to look at because, you know, on the posting period page, it keeps the most recent time it was open or closed. But if you're trying to track something with like, you know, was the period opened? That one has been excellent. Um, let's see, we could look at vendor changes. Um, and then even like a role or a user. So you could see, you know, what when the user was like created or if there was some change uh, made on the user, that can be very helpful. And then um, even to filters. So, uh, so there's a lot of different um, options here. And then let's just go ahead and, you know, I kind of forget, uh, I should have jotted down a date range for myself here. Let's do I think we've had some purchase order updates in June. So let's go ahead, run this. So it's just going to run for purchase orders. Oh, um, specific users honestly I didn't use this one as much but maybe when you're looking at this like you know with the districts this will be something that that makes more sense um you know because you'll maybe know which user made a change you're trying to look at um that and so if you need to select a specific user to filter this report by you can um also if I leave this blank so my selected box is blank over here it will run for all that works the same for objects. So I picked purchase order, so I'm only getting purchase order. But if I had left this blank, I would get it for everything. So I don't have to like go in and select everything if I want all, um, only if I just want to narrow it down by something specific. So let me get this generated. And um, OK, so I have my cover page here. It's showing me what I selected. And then so this is what it looks like. So. Um, we have our timestamp. We have the username. So this is who made the change. The operation, did they add something? Did they change something? Did they delete it? And then this gives us like um, the type of change. And look at, here's our PO number. Here's our PO and item number. And then it goes through and tells us, you know, what was updated in the different fields. So obviously these are adding. So it didn't exist before. And then here's the information that was populated. So I won't go, I won't go like too much farther into that, but just as far as like running it and stuff, I think that that is just, you know, super helpful. There are a lot of situations where that can come in handy. So I wanted to kind of overview uh, that report specifically real quick. Okay. Okay, I'm going to kind of switch over to talking about um, the more of the template reports. Do we have any questions about um, the canned reports uh, before we move before we move on here? Okay. All right. So uh, the canned reports, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm still on canned reports, the template reports. So the template reports, you can see them in, in a couple of different places here. Um, I have some favorited reports on my homepage because I knew I wanted to talk about these since um, these related to canned reports. And um, if I do show all, that will show my entire list. Or I can go to the report manager under the report menu. And this is the same list of reports but I get a little bit more detail. Um, okay. So uh, let's see. Uh, the first thing um, I want to, I kind of want to talk about generating one of these first um, before we talk about modifying them. And what you'll see is I have my SSDT reports. I have these reports that I went and grabbed. I grabbed some of these from our public reports library um, that have been out there for quite some time. And what I see um, a lot even still, and I, and I don't know how often people are using them. I don't know to what extent they're customized, but what I see a lot is that districts have a ton of these customized versions in here. 
And some of them might be budget summary report by fund, you know, budget summary by object. And this is what I was kind of talking about earlier is that totally used to be necessary when they were in the early waves, like, you know, wave two, wave three, like that was the way to get, like, that's how they had to, to do it, to get, like, if they wanted the header and the subtotal to be by object, like that was necessary and they would save a different version of each. Um, but, you know, we know that that was tough. It required customization. And so the option I'm going to talk about um, it made that so it's not necessary. So now that we're getting towards the end of migrations, you know, I, I really want to point this out because, you know, there might be some of these districts that have just been doing it that way that could, you know, be using this dynamic sort option that I'm going to talk about instead of having to have their different versions. Um, and maybe some have already kind of shifted to doing that. But just something to be aware of, you know, I think it, it's it's something that, you know, I mean, if they're trained when they go on to redesign to do it this way, I wouldn't blame them at all for still, you know, sticking with those versions they're used to. Um, so these we're not going to look at because what we're going to do is we're going to run these. So let's see, we have budget summary report by fund, by um, OPU and fund special cost center, and by object. So let's go run those without making custom reports. Um, so here's my budget summary. I'm going to go ahead and generate. And actually, let's do this. Let's go back to our default. And OK, so the query options, this is where we would filter down. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let's say, let's do an 006. And then Let's do the as of period. Actually, I think our as of period is good. Um, okay, so this last uh, tab here, sort options, is kind of what, what we saw on the canned reports that I was mentioning. Um, if you look at these sortable properties and scroll down here, we have options to add a sort. And um, by doing so, we can also add like a subtotal. So the first one was budget summary by fund. Well, if I um, hover over this, I can see the current sort is by cash account and then by the full account code, so the expenditure account. So right now, this is going to be sorted by the cash account first. And then because it has this control break check, that means that it's going to be my header and it's going to be my subtotal by the cash account, which is fund special cost center. So let's generate this real quick and just make sure that we have data in this 006 because I um, forget if this is the one that I use for testing. <laughs> so we want to make sure. Okay. All right. So full account code here. This is the cash account, the 006, um, and then special cost center with all zeros. Uh, just to point out, uh, this right here, full account code, I know it's confusing um, because I keep saying cash account. That is one of the things that we also improved on the canned version is we updated that so that it actually says cash account and it's much less confusing. Um, but okay, so this is what we're seeing. And then if we scroll down here, this is like our total by that um, by that cash account. So let's go back. We'll do generate again. Boom, over to our sort options. All right, what was our first option? By fund. Okay, so I have fund over here. I'm going to drag this above the cash account because, you know, maybe there's like multiple cash accounts in a fund. And then I'm going to check control break and generate. That right there was that first extra custom, uh, extra like template report. Now we have it with two clicks. We drug it over and we checked a box. That's all by fund. This is the same thing that that extra template report would do. Um, I hope I'm not clicking too fast, but you know these are uh, very quick changes. So here, let's go back to, mm, actually I have my figure. So to take this off, we'll just go ahead, drag it back over here. 
we had by fun special cost center which boom we have and uh the other the next one was also by object so i'm going to put the object below the uh cash account just because you know there'll be objects in each cash account check our box generate There we go. Okay, here's the group for object 141, 144, 151, and it's got totals for each. And then what else did we have? Oh, oops, by OPU. Well, I skipped ahead by object, but by OPU, <laughs> uh, that's what I get for not writing them down, but um, we can do that too. So uh, back to budget summary. And okay, get the object out of there. We want to put the OPU um, in here, and then we could do that. Now, I just want to point out that you know there are some other options in here too. So you know these reports I have as an example is like by the actual individual OPU. But if I wanted it just to be at the one digit level or like object one digit level, so um, I could do that. And I, I have, I would just, you know, drag over which one. What that means is, so object one digit level is it's going to group all of the 100s. It's going to group all of the 200s. And so then it'll have, you know, object 100 as the header and anything that's in the 100s will fall underneath that. Um, OPU, um, I'm not going to run this just because we've been kind of running um, through them. So um, the other thing to mention here is that when you are doing this, so we have by fund special cost center and OPU, I can make a save and recall. And I'm just hitting tab, I'm gonna save that. Okay, let's drag this one back over. Um, I said I wanted it by fund. Um, so again, just drop down, select the blank. Or I can just even make this say like by, by fund and save that. Now I will note, um, this saves like all of the things that you have going on in this generate window. So me saving these save and recalls is also saving my my filter for fund. So like they might not want to do that part if they're you know actually intending to do this. Um, but yeah, any different combinations of these um, sort options will can be included in the save and recall so here let's switch back to this boom they switched so basically the point i'm trying to make here is that instead of having these template revert versions um they can actually use uh maybe kind of switch over and do save and recall and then it's all housed within one report again showing this on the template version right now um, but once we get that bug fixed on the canned version, they could also do this on the canned version and then get the performance and get the easiness of being able to do it on the fly instead of having these different template versions. So um, let's see. Oh, uh, one thing I also wanted to mention, so uh, just back to our query options here. Just to kind of um, keep this consistent, we talked about uh, the filters and um, the total as of period on uh, the financial detail can. So if we look at total as of period, these, you know, I mentioned how the canned version has the drop down. Um, these don't have a drop down. You have to type in a date. And uh, so you'll see I have some previous ones I've typed in here. And what this will do is it's it'll it's telling the system what period you want it as of. It's not telling it what date you want it as of. Um, and I know that seems confusing, but um, here's the example. If I type in 6121, I'm gonna get my totals 
as of June 2021. So anything that's happened in June 21. If I put in as of 63021, also as of June 2021, those two dates, whether I put in 61 or 630, will give me the same thing because they're both in June. So mostly just think of it like you're putting in a date that is in the month that it's going to be, it'll give you the totals for, but the actual date that you choose within that month doesn't matter. Definitely a reason that we changed this on the canned report, but, um, but yeah, so at least that gives you a way to do it on the fly without, you know, changing your current period because otherwise um, it's going to go by whatever period you're in. Um, and what that means, you know, for a report like the budget summary, like I'm talking about the fiscal to date total, the month to date total. So, you know, if I put that in and then run the budget summary, I'm going to be seeing the fiscal to date figures for last year instead of this year. Um, filter name. So same thing. I uh, would have to type in here. Salaries instead of getting my list of ones that exist. We do also have a filter on here for exclude accounts with zero amounts. This is true or false um, or leave blank to include all accounts. So if I wanted to just have um, accounts that had figures associated with them, I could type true or just a T will do the trick um, to filter that down. All right. Um, let's see. Let's go. So we're kind of working these pages backwards. I hope that's okay. But um, you know, the I wanted to jump right to the, you know, right to the big stuff. Uh so let's, you know, before we uh move on to the next thing, let's just go ahead and quickly talk about the report options page, the formats. So we've been running everything in PDF, but just to note that there are definitely different um options. You have a CSV. Um if I scroll down here, I do have Excel data. So Excel data is the spreadsheet version. And then um, Excel, just regular Excel, it looks, so here, let's actually run. So let's switch this to Excel. I'm just gonna give you a quick view of what something like this looks like. Um, because it's, you know, it's on the Excel versions, like they have differences. And um, once we, I just mostly, I think easier to see by looking at it. So um, this is the regular Excel, not Excel data. And when we look at this, you can see, look at it preserved. It has kind of like the formatting on it still. You know, it doesn't bring these in as like raw data values. And so, you know, this, it really depends on the use that you're going for here. Because like this one, it has the headers, you know, it has your subtotals and everything in it. Um, but like if you needed to modify something here, you know, you could you know, I could go ahead and like type something in and then I could print this out and it would be like a modified version of maybe what I'd see as a PDF in a way. So this has its uses. Um, obviously, if you are looking for like an actual data spreadsheet, then you want that Excel data version um, or a CSV. I just want to note though that um, the headers, so when we're talking about these different like you know, these sort and control breaks, these are a formatting thing. You know, you're adding these sort options as formatting in a report. The versions of um, the formatting that are not, um, that don't include like format features. So like a comma separated values or an Excel data, these are like inherently just raw data formats. So they don't include headers. They don't include totals. Like it's just giving you the actual data that you're selecting, 
by you know the columns that are on this report. So where this gets really confusing is with the summary report. So if you want to do a summary report, you should be using a PDF. You could use the regular Excel, but um, if you use Excel data or if you use a CSV, the summary report is not going to read right because what that does is it only shows you headers and subtotals. So in a format that doesn't include headers and subtotals, that summary report is not possible just by the nature of that format. So, um, so basically, uh, just think about it where, yeah, Excel data and CSV will not include um, the stuff that basically what you're setting up in here as far as control breaks. Okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to go off too much on a tangent with that, but I wanted to mention it just so you know ahead of time. It's something that, you know, like if you're not expecting it and you don't like, you know, if you're um, like not realizing basically that the summary report is basically just showing you the headers, then it's like, I know it can be confusing. Um, okay. All right, next up is we are going to talk about modifying a report now, um, like actually customizing a template report. So um, I am again in this report manager and I'm gonna click this eye icon to open up the, like the editing view of the report. Now this says, you know, it says custom report creator here. So this is the same view that you would have if you were starting a report from scratch. And the first thing that I wanna point out here, select object. So select object, you know, if you are editing any sort of report, I would say that this is very important to look at. Uh, this impacts, you know, all of the different properties that you have available to you in the report. And it also gives you context for what you're seeing here. So um, I know that actually coming in and editing these can be, you know, quite intimidating. I know we've had some districts, especially when they, you know, first start with redesign and they go in and try and do this, it can be very overwhelming. Um, you know, we've definitely had discussions in the past about like, you know, these properties and having some kind of like, you know, tracking that shows like what they are and where they come from and that sort of thing. But the difficulty is this object can pull from basically any page. And it depends on what page you're pulling from as to, you know, how those properties are going to appear and how it connects with the other fields from other pages that it's pulling. So that said, like doing something to say like, oh yes, this is the exact field. This is exactly where it's coming from. Like there, it, it relies on which object. And if you can see how many objects and even just how many properties I have from one, that's a massive, you know, thing. So what I can recommend is, so the object, we're looking at the expenditure account. All right. Um, let me do this, just, I don't wanna flip back and forth here, is let me open another tab and I'll show you what I'm talking about here where it's like, it's coming from the page, right? So um, we'll use this as an example, um, expenditure account. So I went core accounts over to the expenditure account tab. And I'm just gonna open up my very first account code here. And we see, okay, so we have the um, account information here. We have a description, forecast line number. Here's our amounts. Um, here's some custom fields. So when I start looking at the information that I have available from these properties, I can see, okay, so active is going to be my active checkbox. Um, we have, you know, uh, full account code is everything together. Uh, the code will break down the different account code pieces. And then, you know, a lot of these like fiscal to date expended, um, percent expended, month to date expended. When I look at this, this is like, you know, um, fiscal year expended, month to date expended. Like these are the fields that it's pulling to put directly on your reports. Obviously, there's a whole lot more here too, right? 
So um, cash account. So if I open up the cash account, now I have cash account fields. If I, you know, expand, um, you know, some of these other ones, it's linking over to other things. Now, this is why it gets very complicated because you might want more than just the stuff, you know, on this one view on your report. And that's why this, it, I think of it like links. So it's like, okay, a lot of my basic information that I don't have to expand for might come directly from the page. But then if I say, okay, now I want information that's linked to the cash account that is like, you know, um, used for that account. So like this, this um, specific expenditure account that we're looking at has a cash account of 001 and then all zeros. So if I add cash account fields, then like anything on this report related to this account, instead of pulling a total from this page we're seeing, it's now going to go look at the 001 cash account, and then it's going to pull the information from that for me. So um, kind of, I guess, you know what I'm saying is kind of think about it like that. Everything that's just basically on this properties list is pretty much pulling from whatever the object is. And then once you start expanding these, you know, you want to pay attention to what you're expanding here, you know, cash accounts and we cash count and um, forecast record gives you some more information related to the forecast. Um, if you do want, if you have something specific and you want to search for it, you can like expand these out and um, you can do control F, um, F like Folkman <laughs> on your keyboard to find, F like find. And then, you know, maybe look for something like, you know, so we'll type in deductions and then that, that gives me this field. But I will say, if you're doing this, you know, hover over. So it tells me this is coming from the budget. Um, you can see like this little pass on here. And then we can see this is coming from this header. So that's the thing. Like, I know that there isn't, you know, something to go to in the documentation that's got a tree of all of these exact, you know, fields and stuff. But honestly, I think if we had that, I think it would be so tough for them to sort through. So these are some tips when they actually are looking at in the software where they can get the information right from what they're seeing. Um, and especially just highlighting, you know, this kind of thing where hovering over any one of these will give it a path showing where it came from. Okay. All right, so that said, let's talk a little bit about like what these properties are. Um, my, my basic explanation is this select properties, uh, what we're seeing on this grid right here, these are things they want to see on the report. When I add this over here, when I add the property, display name, this is like basically what my columns will be. So my column is gonna have the cash account. It'll have the full account code. It'll have the description, you know, and it'll have these um, different um, totals. Now, I might not see all of these because I might not be using them as columns, but that's like your basic idea. So uh, if we scroll down, we see at the bottom here, we're like, wait a minute, all of those things aren't columns on this report. And they're not. We have these added so that they can be used for those sort options. And then we have this, uh, these three dots are the extended properties and it's suppressed. So um, there are some exceptions, but the, but the basics, like the reason that I'm adding these, you know, if it's not for one of those exceptions is so that it's seen on the report. And then um, that, I want to say that to compare it to configure filters, which this is how we narrow down what shows in those columns. So, you know, this means I'm going to see, you know, for every account that I have, I'm going to see the code, the description, and the totals. And then this is going to say, well, which accounts is it? with the configure filters options. Um, let's see, okay. So, so the other thing we can talk about here is um, with modifying these. Um, so when you're in here, this one we can see our cash account. Okay, so that's our fund special cost center. 
And then we have our full account code. This is our like actual expenditure account. Now, these are the ones that have sort properties. This is a budget summary. This is what we just looked at for a previous example. So these two being set at prior sort priority one and two, this configuration right here is why when we just opened that report and went into the sort options before we made any changes, we were seeing these two in this order. And that is dictated right here by the sort priority. And then the control break, that was already configured as well. Um, that's because of this setup right here. So I'm going to switch over to this generate report. This is like our little preview of what it looks like. And what I'm talking about is this. We, you know, when we were actually generating, this is what we saw. And this right here is the reason why. If you are customizing a report and you want those like default sort options to show differently, you need to change it on this page right here, the select properties. Um, I could go in and let's say, let's just make the description. You know, I don't know why you would do this, but this is the next one in line here. So let's make the description the third sort. And then um, when I come over here, look at now the description is automatically on there included as something that's going to sort. So that's specifically dictated here. I know that this can be confusing because now in the generate report option, you know, we keep looking at that and that's our preview. But if you change it in that um, last tab, it's not going to actually save it on your template report. You need to change it in here if you're actually trying to change what the default is. Um, okay. Control break. So, you know, we kind of looked at this with the sort options. You know, we checked that. That's what made it the header. That's really your important thing to remember with the control break. If I want to have it so that it's going to add that header and then it's going to add a subtotal, then um, you're going to want to click to control break. Okay. Um, and then let's see, I just want to make sure that we hit everything here before I'm jumping too far. Okay. All right. Um, so the function here is um, the next thing that we'll hit. And, and this is basically like, uh, it's it's available for um, these fields that are numerical. So we have like our expendable, our expended, encumbrance, and the function options. I have like some average, minimum, maximum. So if I click some, this is when every time there's a control break, I keep saying subtotal because it's the most common to have a subtotal. But this is when that's when the function is going to happen. So. Let's go. I closed the one that had the uh, the objects where we could easily see it. But uh, let me just scroll down here. So these right here at the end of every fund special cost center, this is a sum. It's the you know it's the total because of that function configuration. The percent it doesn't make sense to add up percent um, to add them up. So that one does not have one, and. That's why we're seeing this one blank. And then um, we do have these extended properties. So, you know, I talked about the suppress. So that would mean like it will be on um, this grid so that you can, you know, maybe use it as a sort or it would show up in the sort options. But if you don't actually want to see it on the report, then that's when you would suppress it. Um, some of these options are exactly the same as the grid, the sort priority, the sort order. Um, however, they will do the same thing. So like if I added this as three and then saved it, it's going to save it as three on here. It's, it's pretty much just so that like, if you are doing something with extended properties, you don't have to go two different places. Like you could actually do, you know, just go through and do things on, um, this extended properties. You just get more in addition. Um, here's control break. A page break will start each new value on a new page instead of just doing it as like a new header. And um, column title can also be helpful. 
So uh, this one, fiscal to date appropriated, but if we wanted it to say something different than this um, on our actual report, we could do that. And then the width, um, this is like the width of the column. So this gives us a little bit of wiggle room with like if things aren't looking exactly how they should on our report, um, you know, maybe our columns are a little bit too smushed and the data is wrapping and we want to um, make that bigger you can manually change the width. Some of these other ones, I know I'm skipping kind of like the control headers, like and footers and, and stuff like that. But I do think that, um, you know, with having the sort options, like I'm not sure how often those will be used anymore. Um, and also, you know, we got a lot to talk about today. So I'm, I'm sorry for not jumping into everything. Um, but certainly if that is something that, you know, we want to talk about in the future, if that's something you want to use, um, you know, I'm happy to discuss that um, at a different time or like through a ticket, you know, um, as well. So, um, because I'm also realizing, you know, I know we made it to 10, <laughs> so I knew it was going to be more than an hour today. Um, so, uh, certainly are. <laughs> All right. All right, so next is configure filters. Let's um, let's see. So uh, we talked about this as like the way to narrow down um, the information that is going to actually be showing on your report. And on our standard reports here, we can see all of these like param values, and um, this is all configured here. So um, basically, what um, I want to talk about is that you can do this. You can, um, especially if you're making like a custom report where you have these options that save param. And what this does, that direct setup, if I go to my little preview here, is what gives these boxes so that a user can enter it on the fly when they're generating report. So all of our like SSDT versions you know, they're written to have these so that they can be typed in on the fly by the user because they might want different accounts, um, you know, that sort of thing. You do have the option um, to actually like hard code things in here. So if I knew I wanted this to be for a specific fund, like I could just type in 001 um, when I generate this report, I no longer have the option to choose a fund, it's always gonna run for the general fund, always. If I, you know, save this report and this is how I ran it. Um, so that is an option. I mean, if you do that, maybe then like the title of the report, you'd be including it. You know, that's just like, there's a very specific, um, like sort of filter that you want to put on this. Um, speaking of filters, there is also an option on here. You could hard code a you could hard code a filter. Um, so if I wanted to put salaries, and then you know, so maybe when I run this, you know, I could save like a version of this. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and save this report. So this saves it. I was customizing the budget summary. This saves it as like my own version of it. Um, so now if I were to go run this from my like report manager grid, it would always run for the general fund for that salaries filter. And uh, I should also mention this with the save report. Um, when, if you're in here customizing, once you give it a new name and save as, then it'll, you know, save your version. Um, when I'm, if I'm in here customizing, I kind of like to do this at the early end, you know, give it the name, do save as, and then you can save as like, as you go and it'll just, okay, cool. Save my updates. And so that way, like, you know, if you accidentally click out of the page or if you have to walk away or something like that, like you can just as long as it has the same name, it'll just update it. So uh, that's kind of a good tip if you're in here updating reports to, you know, just like get your new report uh, made and then, you know, do the save as 
um, throughout, if you think about it, to just kind of like safeguard for yourself. All right. So the other thing I want to mention, these parameters. Okay. I know I'm sure like if this is not something you see often, this looks, you know, okay, what the heck does this mean? Right. Uh, this is where, you know, I promised we would go back to this, uh, to the wiki eventually. I'm going to hop in the custom report creator documentation. I was in USAS. So this is USAS. Um, I'm sure we have a page for this in USPS too, but just as far as um, where I'm gonna hop right now is I'm gonna go to configure filters on this custom report creator. And let me just zoom out a little bit on this one. And so this is where we see, okay, we have this example with these different parameters here. And if I scroll down, I have a whole grid that tells me operation which operation is what decides like what it's going to do. So you'll notice I had some that were like, some that were equals. So equals means it's going to match the exact value that I put in the filter value. I have things like not equals, you know, like means begins with. So that one you can use uh, the wild cards in, you can see here. We're talking about a whole lot of information today. So I'm gonna kind of leave it at that. But if you are configuring these filters, coming to this grid right here to look at the, what those different operations mean and choose the one that's going to work for you is, um, you know, very, very helpful. It's very important. Um, based on which one of these operations you choose, then you can scroll over here and you actually have an example. Okay, so then you're like, I don't want to hard code it. I want to be able to choose that on the fly. So how do I do those param? Um, you know, what, what are those codes? How do I know what to type in? Right here, this will help, um, this will help you with creating those. So here's an example of what this looks like. And then here's what it would look like um, on the report when it when it goes to be generated. There's also some information up here that tells you about the different values that are going in these parentheses. And um, so like sometimes you'll see them where there's three, sometimes you'll just see one and this kind of explains how and why. And so depending on what you're setting up, uh, you know, the operation, um, if you want the field name to be different than what, you know, shows when the report's running, like all those different variables, you know, will impact maybe how you enter these. Um, and again, that is totally something that I'm willing to help with. You know, we can help you out if you put in a ticket um, to tweak those parameters because, you know, there, there are many different combinations. But I think this page is extremely helpful uh, when you are building those. So I'm just kind of scrolling down here to show you that each different operation has you know, different examples right in here so you can see. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to the software here. And then, yeah, so generate report, I know we've been hopping over here. So just to kind of, um, you know, bring this all together, the report options on here, this, I can actually use this to say like, okay, yes, this is always going to run to the Excel format and I want to save that in my report. And then when I go to, you know, run this report, it will default to this format. Um, also the name, the orientation, everything on this first tab will actually save in here. Um, everything that I'm seeing in the query options, this comes from configure filters. Everything that I'm seeing in sort options, this comes from select properties. If I just check this and then save, that will do nothing if I do something different on these other tabs um, because these are just showing me the first two. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Okay. So, you know, I mean, I know we've been going a little bit more than an hour here. I'm going to be honest with you. I do have... Um, so I'm going to talk about the report bundles and stuff. Let's just take like, let's take five. Let's take until 10, 15, um, just in case anybody needs like refill their coffee, you know, um, take a stretch. Uh, let's just take a quick five minute break and then we'll come, we'll hop right back into, um, into talking about these reports.
Okay, and we're back. So, um, all right, I, um, I'm gonna just jump right back into uh, where we left off here. And uh, we're still in USAS. Um, one more thing that I want to show, and it's kind of like brings a lot of this back together, but this is also a really um, helpful tip if um, you are trying to kind of like make a custom report. So what we're looking at here, you know, we came in, we, we clicked that um, eye icon on the report manager to open up the budget summary. So we started with a budget summary. Um, the, the custom report creator, like if you just click that right from this reports menu, it's going to be blank. You start with just this, you just need to go in and pick your object to start. That can be super intimidating. I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't usually do that. Um, so here's a tip. I'm gonna to go to my activity ledger query and there is a way to start a custom report from any one of these grids that have the report option. So um, let's go here. So let me show you. I'm going to go ahead and put in 7121 as my date. And then I'm going to make like a little invoice report. So I'm going to put an in invoice for my type. Let's do, so if I put in a thousand, it's going to be for um, any invoices that were over a thousand dollars that um were in you know starting 7121 or later and you know this is something that i might look at on the grid but if i wanted to have this as a report then i totally could um i could come in here and i could just make a report you know i can choose my um format type i do have the sort options here this gives me like options to use the things that are on my grid. Um, and I could run a report right from here. Excellent. However, there maybe are some formatting things that we could change. Like there are some other benefits we could get if we made this through like the custom report creator. So let's get ourselves started. Um, save as. I think we could call it that invoice report. And um, if I use this little save as here, I'm going to click save report. Boom. Report has been saved as invoice report. And then that went to my report manager. Invoice report. And I could click the eye icon here. And I can see that all of these fields on my select properties, these were the columns on my grid. Boom. Everything that I had, you know, checked on with the more option shows here. Configure filters. Here's the date that I typed in. Here is um, the type when I made it, you know, I just want to see invoices. And then here's the amount. So everything that I typed into that grid when I then went to the report and did save as translated to how it would look in here. It even chose my greater than or equal to options because I said, you know, I know on a grid, if I type in a thousand, it's going to be everything a thousand or higher. The system knows that. Um, and then the benefit of this is, so actually, I should have probably just generated this so we could see what it looked like um, out of the gate. But um, so here's what it looked like. You know, it had all of my different columns on here. Um, and then, you know, when I go to the bottom, so the amount did total, and then it's actually totaling this uh, PO item number, which we don't want it to do that. So let's go ahead and make some um, updates then. So let's see, I have date, I have vendor number, um, PO item, let's turn this off. The amount we do want it total for that. Uh, let's see. Let's do, um, let's have it do a subtotal by invoice number. So I'm going to make my invoice the first sort and then boom, we'll check that so that it gives it a header uh, by invoice number and a subtotal. Um, and then Let's see the type field right here. So we're looking at this. 
the type field is just invoice. Well, we know that. We, we made this report so that it's all invoices. So we don't need to see this. So let's go ahead and suppress that. And then let's see. Um, I think the rest of this looks pretty good. Let's see what we got. Oh, let's change the name here too. And then, okay, cool. So invoice number, and then it's going to have the amount. It's going to have the status. If we wanted to reorder these, we could totally do that too. Um, but, you know, now it's got all of these together and um, our total. And then that was like a really quick and easy way that we could get ourselves started on having a custom report instead of having to like come in here and do this from scratch. So um, that, um, again, if I go back to my activity ledger, um, once I put my filters in here, Again, that option's right at the bottom, and that's on you know any of the grids with the with the um, report option, the save as you can do that from. Okay. Okay, so I know we're we're pretty used as here. We're going to switch over to USPS um, just after this next part to talk about the report bundles and such. Um, this part is um, the periodic reports. Like this is pretty specific to USA. This is definitely just um, USA specific, but I wanted to hit it. I wanted to fit it in here just because I think these reports, you know, are very important to the treasurers. And just talking about how some of these work with um, the different like fund levels. I, I just want to have this. Um, so we take a look real quick. <laughs> Um, all right, so the appropriation resolution report is the first one I'm going to talk about here. And when you come in here, pretty straightforward, you have your fiscal year, you have different versions of this report that you can use, um, you have your format, and then you have your generate. Now, let's go to our wiki. And I'm going to the USS documentation. We'll go to um, periodic and then appropriation resolution. And um, so what we want to go to, it says like, you know, please click here for more information on the reporting levels. And this takes us to the bottom of the page. This right here. So there are options that can be configured if they want um certain funds to show differently on this report. It is a per fund option, and that's why it is um, this way as opposed to just something on the report, because some, some funds they might want more broken down, some funds they might want less. So basically what we, we're going to look at is on each fund, they have this checkbox that says include in resolution, and then the resolution levels can be chosen. So like, is this just going to show a total per fund? Is it going to break it down per fund special cost center? Or maybe even as like, you know, different functions, different objects. Um, so where that is, core accounts. And then we're in the fund. And if we go ahead and open this up and look at the fund information, um, it's right here this include in resolution. So if I uncheck this, it's no longer shown on that report. But if I check this, okay, boom, um, the general fund includes all of these different levels. Um, and then let's look at like a random one here. Um, I wonder, let's, uh, let's go run this report. Um, we'll take a look at it and then we'll look at one with that has a different setup. So, um, so let's just go ahead, generate this. Also want to um, point out this summarize recap by fund. So this is a new option that's been added over the last year or so um, that um, updates so that the very last page of this report, regardless of these options that we're talking about, there'll always be a final page that is just recapping it by fund code only. So, um, okay, so here, so we have general, and then, so this is where that checkbox is for fund. 
So uh, right here. So fund, fund special cost center, and then each one of these. So fund, fund special cost center. This is the first digit of the function, second digit of the function, and then first digit of the object. So that the reason that is being broken down like that is directly because of that setup. Um, if we look down here, do I have any? These look like they're all kind of broken down. I was wondering if we had any that were just funds, but that's okay. Let's go look at this fund recap. So um, the fund recap at the bottom here is just, so this is just, you know, by uh, the fund level for every single one, um, regardless of that configuration that's used earlier on the report. Okay. And then the other one, um, actually, let's stay here on the account. I'm going to go to my other tab and let's do um, periodic the certification reports. So again, we have different options when we go to run this report. We have a couple different versions. I'm going to keep this as like the um, amended certificate detail. And then um, these are some different items that can be entered when the report is run. Um, but documentation, uh, I'm going to go, let's go back. Uh, so go back to the start. And uh, periodic, and then certification appropriation. Um, this also has fund levels for reporting. So similar thing, um, however, this one's like off to the side. So this could be fund or fund special cost center. Uh, so let's go over here. And what I'm talking about is right here. Fund, fund, special cost center. So again, and that works pretty much the same way where it's, you know, that's going to impact exactly what you see on that report. I just want to point these out because I know when we're talking about reports, like most of them, you know, uh, these different options, you're just used to seeing them when you run the report. So these two are exceptions where it's pre-configured on the fund. So just uh, want to, you know, mention that as we're talking about some of these things so that um, and keep that in mind, um, you know, when they go to run those reports, if there is something they want different. Okay. Okay, so um, that brings us to um, where we're going to switch gears here. I'm going to um, switch over to USPS. We're going to talk about the report bundles um, versus just kind of focusing on like different report options. Um, again, I know there's like so much to talk about here that I tried to kind of give some highlights. I know, you know, we probably could drill down into some more details on things, but, you know, while we're just talking about, you know, customizing reports, template reports, canned reports, does anybody have any questions, um, anything else that we want to talk about specifically with like running reports before we switch over to the report bundles? Okay. Why does the amended certificate not have the option by fiscal year? So um, if we go into the certificate reports. So the, um, cert the certificate reports are going to run based on the current fiscal year, based on the current period. So um, the totals that are included, like those are going to be based on, you know, the current period, what point in time. Um, there actually was like uh, in the past, there used to be a little drop down on that, but um, it's, it's using the information from the current year. So it doesn't really make much sense to have that, um, like drop down on there. Um, however, well, and I guess the other thing is that if we look at, let's run this real quick. If we look at the information on here, Okay, so we have the unencumbered balance July 1. So this is going to run, so the unencumbered balance July 1 is at the start of this current year. Um, if we wanted to run this, like, so say we now want this for like the next year, 
what I could do is go into the posting periods and like change the current period or like once we switch over to July, then it would um, run based on that. Um, let's run the other version as well. Okay. And so this one, so cash balance, um, June 30th. Um, so all of these, since they're like pretty specific to, um, like points in time and, you know, in the carryover and such. So, um, yeah, so that one runs based on the current period versus like a drop down. Well, if you still have questions, please feel free to continue asking them. I'm going to go ahead and just switch over to USPS and um, let me get this. Get our wiki back up here. So um, for USPS, let's go into the documentation here. Um, we do have the report section. So this report section, again, quite a bit bigger because um, you have, you know, the report bundles and manager, and then a lot of their reports are uh, canned reports in when we're looking at the USPS system. And so you have details on those here. Um, report bundles, I'm going to go ahead and um, hop in here. So uh, let's go also into the software. All right, so we're going reports, report bundles. Now in both softwares, what you're gonna see when you come in here is, um, and you can see like by username, is you'll see all of these SSDT bundles. And so each um, software has like their own pre-configured like SSDT bundles that are included. And what these, um, what these do is like at certain points in time or certain processes, these will automatically set, you know, pre-configured reports to go to the file archive so that um, they have those, they have like a record of those reports to refer back to. The very first thing, and I actually already had it on here, but I want to talk about is um, maybe not always, it like, totally depends on what you're looking at this grid for. But one thing that I want to look at today and that may be helpful in some situations for you to add to your grid as well is um, adding the archive type, the event, and the send to address. And, um, you know, again, like, you know, maybe like not day to day, but sometimes like if you're trying to look at these and especially if they have custom bundles, these three things I found very helpful to add to your report bundle grid. And uh, let's, I'm just going to go ahead and like, Let's condense some of these ones that we don't need so we can see. Actually, okay, I kind of want this. Let me uh, zoom. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Okay, so what we can see here, so archive type just has to be selected for all of these, like anytime they're going to be uh, scheduling on like an event or a cron job, they need to have the archive type filled in. So that's going to be important, um, just like if you're reviewing. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, I'll mention something with that in a little bit as well. But the event, so this shows you when these are scheduled to, to run, to fire. And um, so like the ACH submission is when an ACH submission is created, then it's going to run this bundle and that's going to send to the file archive into the ACH submission section. And so, you know, each one of these is kind of configured. Um, and again, these are all the pre-configured ones, but I found this like really helpful, especially if you have districts that are starting to schedule their own, you know, it's, it's kind of nice. Um, and again, like with events specifically, you'll you'll see the send to address if it's scheduled on an event. So that can be very helpful. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, let's just go through kind of the steps of making like a little custom report here or a custom bundle here. So if we create one, we'll give it a name.
and a description. A tag can be used, like we see that column on the grid in the background. So like if there, if you want to like tag, you know, the ones that are running monthly or like, you know, they have some kind of income and tag. So it makes it easier to filter that grid and like see a group of them together. You could add tags. And then select a report to add to the bundle. So um, with this, I want to point out too that, you know, you have, you have canned um, reports and you have standard reports. Uh, like the template reports, you could choose either um, to be adding to these bundles. Um, if I start typing, like I'm typing, you know, terminated, and if that's in any part of the report name, then it filters it down. So that makes it pretty easy. Um, so, so that's helpful. Um, while I'm mentioning that, you know, you can get the canned version or the grid or the template version um, in USAS, the names are slightly different, but um, we have them noted, I believe, in the um, report bundles, like documentation page for USAS, um, you know, for which ones, for like the exact naming for the uh, canned versions. So, um, okay, so once we select the report, then it comes here. Okay, so if there are multiple versions of this report. Now, we talked about the different save and recalls, like how you could save, you know, different flavors of those reports with different um, sort and subtotals, and then you could save those with the save and recall. So if you have multiple versions of those, um, that will pop up in this first little box here. So you can choose like which save and recall version um, of those parameters that you want. So this one, I just have one. And then once I click the plus, it's going to add it to the bottom. And then that's actually in my bundle. But this is just like a little, you know, preview of, okay, so here's the report, but here's the different versions that I can select. Now I have it here. I can edit. So like, even if I did do a save and recall version, but I wanted to, you know, update it slightly, like I could do that. Um, let's do this. So, you know, start date we could say, you know, I want it to be as of this start date, um, you know, or I could do it as of like the current month. Um, I could use my little date shortcuts and then that would run it based on the current period at the time that this runs. Uh, you do have sort options in here. So if you wanted to modify, you know, your sort options, so let's make it, you know, by last name. We could update all of those. Um, I could generate it as like an example, or I could just go ahead and continue. That'll save it. And then, you know, I could go ahead and add another report in here if I wanted to. And then once I'm done, I just go ahead and save. Um, now, let's see. So um, when you create it, then we can go in here and schedule. And this is one thing I just want to talk about kind of how this works with the different options for scheduling. Okay, so uh, let's go hop a little bit around here. Immediate means it's going to send right now. So I could put in my email address, I could put in, um, I do need to select an archive type. No matter the option, I need to select an archive type. If you don't select an archive type and say you schedule it like on an event, it will cause an issue. Um, again, that's easy to locate for one schedule on event using this grid tip that we looked at. So keep that in mind. Uh, we absolutely have a JIRA issue to update this and make it required because I know that, you know, it's not required, then it's like sometimes they just skip selecting that. They don't know what it means. So, um, but very important to select that. Um, if I do immediate, so I'm going to run it immediately. And what this is going to do is it's going to create a one-time job in the job scheduler. And that job is going to run. It's going to send my report immediately. And then it's going to be, it's done. It's just a one-time job. So then it'll go away. If I um, schedule on an event, this is where I can choose, you know, we see all the different events that these um, standard ones are set on. So, you know, I choose an event, 
again, my output to is like an email address. I could use, um, I can send it to the file archive um, or even to like FTP it, choose an archive type and then schedule an event. What that is going to do is every time that event happens in the system, this is now gonna hold it on this grid. So then when that, when that happens, then it's gonna kind of work the same as like an immediate. So it'll say, okay, boom, this event happened. Let me go make that one-time job and send it because the event happened. And then, you know, it keeps the information here waiting for that event to happen again. If you schedule it as a cron job, you're gonna put in the cron expression and then put in your output. Um, and then what this will do, so a cron expression is gonna be like a regular interval to have this happen. So let's say you're, you're setting this up, you want it to go weekly. Well, since we know what that regular inter interval is, you can make the cron expression that says, you know, once a week on this day, and then you'll go ahead and save it. This one works differently than the other two where it's like, it's not just a one-time job that it's sending over. It's going to send over the job to the job scheduler. That's going to fire when the current expression tells it to. But if it's like a regular interval where it's every week, then that job's actually going to stay in the job scheduler, holding that information that you told it. And then every time you know, whatever that um, regular interval is, then it'll continue, then it'll send it. So if that's weekly on Friday, it'll send it today and then it'll keep the job in the job scheduler and then it'll send it next week um, and, you know, continue on. The reason that I bring this up is because we have had a couple questions recently. And so I just wanted to be able to talk it out. Um, it, I understand where it can be confusing because if it's if it's sending it with the cron expression and it's you know set to go off regularly, all of that happens in the job scheduler. If you set it with the cron, it's not housing the information on like this report bundle uh, record the same way that it would with an event because it already has all the information that it needs. Like think about it the same way as like you know it sends immediate, but then it runs like if you run the immediate option, it sends it, but then it just runs once. Cron, same thing, it sends it, but then it's just gonna continue to run. The event is the only one where I would expect to see these uh, filled out on the grid like this. Because if it has the event, the job scheduler doesn't keep track of the event. This page keeps track of the event and then just you know, sneaky sends it to the job scheduler whenever that event happens. So, um, okay. Oh, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, with this is, you know, with uh, talking about the job scheduler, was talking about these report bundles. So um, this, especially the job scheduler, uh, it's um, something that um, their live instance, you know, has certain jobs and such in it, it's set up to, to run certain things. If you're trying to test and pull like a test instance or we pull a backup, like you can't always see the same thing because you know the same jobs aren't necessarily set up in there, nor would you want them to be if you're like, if you make a test instance, you don't want your test instance sending to people's emails, right? So, um, so let's look at like what makes these send, right? So if you're gonna do a test instance or maybe like the first time setting up the district to have emails go, um, you know, what's required to actually have these go off. Um, the first thing is configuration. So application configuration, this specifically relevant to like, if you have a test instance or something. So production, this is how it would look in their live instance. Um, you know, if you have like um, a support instance or something like a test instance, these are usually disabled by default. So if you pull a backup to test something for them and then you're like, you know, I, I sent that immediate and it didn't even run in the job scheduler. Well, it's probably because these are disabled. So in order for you know you to be able to send the report bundles, uh, this would need to at least be checked. External notification, that's what's gonna, um, like no emails can go unless this is checked. Speaking of email, there is also um, email uh, configuration. 
Um, and then let's see the module um, for email notification services that does need to be on and configured um, for it to actually be able to send via email. Um, if you start, you know, setting up custom bundles that they want to have uh, sent to, um, you know, to their staff. Now in USPS, a lot of them use like the, the, the direct deposit notices and such, like, you know, it's probably pretty common that they have email set up in USPS. In USAS, you know, if they're not using bundles, like, or, you know, if they're not sending reports, like that might be something that they do need to actually get configured to be able to do that. Okay. Okay, uh, so last thing to the job scheduler. Um, now, um, in USAS and um, USPS, I don't remember, honestly, let me just double check real quick so we can talk about this in the right context here. No, okay, so there isn't, so there's not an audit bundle that I'm seeing in um, USPS, but in USAS, there is still like an audit report bundle that has certain reports, um, you know, that the auditors had wanted, um, but in both softwares now, the preferred way, um, instead of using the bundle, so even though that's still there in USAS, um, we've added the audit jobs instead of audit bundles. And the audit job is a grouping of the different reports that the auditors want for each software. There are reports um, we do create here. There are reports for district audit job and SOC 1 audit job. And um, these can be scheduled right through this job scheduler now. You would choose the job type, enter a cron schedule. So a regular interval to maybe send like, you know, once a year on a certain date. Um, my understanding is the auditors are kind of like determining, you know, requesting specific dates so that they can stagger when they're receiving those. Um, but once that is, once that is um, scheduled, it'll show in the job scheduler here. And when that runs, what it will do is it will automatically send those reports to AOS and it's going to send them to the file archive. So, you know, those are different than bundles, but just another thing, you know, that um, relates to reports. Um, and then let me go to USPS. We're going to go to the job scheduler. And um, right here, create audit jobs is what we're talking about. And then here's a listing of like which reports are included. Um, also on the job scheduler page in USAS that has the USAS related reports. Um, the big thing to remember with this is um, when this job scheduler, or yeah, when this job runs for the audit job, what it's going to do is it's going to generate the reports for the previous fiscal year. So, and that's based on the current period. So right now, like I'm in March, 2022 in this instance. So it would be for fiscal year 21 if I ran those right now. So basically what the idea of this is, is that, you know, they close the fiscal year and then after the fiscal year is closed, you know, maybe those would be set up for the audit time because the audit's always going to be for like a previous fiscal year. Like they're not auditing them on the year that's happening. So that's why they work that way to make sure that that's convenient. So it, it sends for that previous year. Um, okay. So yeah, I think that that covers it for the audit jobs. Um, again, like, you know, we looked at the, a lot of the report um, like customizing reports in USAS, we looked at the report bundles in USPS, but you know, um, the, the core functionality is the same for those between softwares. So, um, you know, even though we're kind of using specific examples on each side, you know, you can apply those same, um, the same core functionality to both. And yeah, that is, that about wraps it up for the specific items that I have to cover today. Thank you all for, you know, hanging out with me. I know we went like a double session today, but um, I'm really happy to talk about this stuff and I really hope this helps, but um, does anybody else have any questions?
Okay. Well, I'll hang out for another minute in case anybody, um, you know, is still typing up a question, but um, if not, I hope you all have a great weekend and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you for coming.